Episode 68 with one of my all-time favorite singers, Mr. Jimmy Fortune. He also sang for many years with the Statler Brothers and now has a great solo career. He wrote one of my favorite songs called Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth, I'm sure missing you. And if you're a Statler Brothers fan, you certainly know that one. Also joining me on this podcast, co-host with me is Brian Edwards. And we really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Uh, Jimmy is a fantastic guy, and I had a chance to perform with him a few times. Certainly a highlight of my career. We had a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Don't forget about our sponsors, Music City Canada, based out of London, Ontario. A great spot to buy all your music equipment. They'll ship right to you. And uh, great guys, great prices. Make sure you check them out on musiccitycanada.com. Also, Morning Buzz Coffee, morningbuzzcoffee.buzz is their website. They'll ship anywhere as well. Uh, a couple of great musicians that own this uh, particular company, and it'd be great if you could support them. And they have fantastic coffee on top of it, so make sure you check out Morning Buzz Coffee. Also, uh, Stickman Clothing Company, based out of Regina, Saskatchewan. They have very, very cool uh, clothing, and you can support them as well, also owned by musicians and uh, stickmanclothingcompany.com is where you find that. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button. And if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, make sure you give us a five-star rating if you don't mind. And leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. All right. This is one of my all-time favorite guys, Mr. Jimmy Fortune. Okay, we're rolling here uh, with my good friend Jimmy Fortune. It's nice to have you on the podcast and uh, we met uh, a few years ago when you performed at our theater here at the Walters Theater. And uh, one of the best weeks we've ever had in the theater. So it's nice to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Darren. Uh, you know, we I said before, it's one of my favorite places to play. I love coming up there. And uh, we, we love playing. It, it's the, the, the place is beautiful, but the people even made it even better. And like you all and your family, uh, really... Um, Really, really looked out for us and showed us a good time. And you got to come up and pick with me, which which I thoroughly enjoyed that and get to play your fiddle and everything. So um, it was a good time. And I'm sure hoping we can get back to doing it again real soon. I hope so, too. And I want to say um, hello to Brian Edwards, co-hosting with me today from Rocklands Entertainment in Peterborough. Nice to have you on, Brian. Hey. Oh, it's a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm a big Jimmy Fortune fan and the... Uh, I certainly have taken in a lot of your shows over the years when you were with the Statlers and watching with Vincent and Daly on their on their television show every once in a while and just yeah. very very good. Well, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. I really do. I've I've been around a long time, as you can see. Got the white hair to prove it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all <of that. laughs> we all have some of that. Yes. Uh, so. So how are things going with, um, I know we were chatting just a bit before we started recording, but we're obviously in this, what we call COVID era and, and how have you been faring with, uh, not performing very much over the last several months? How has it, how's it been for you? Well, I've, uh, you know, I've been surviving it pretty good. I haven't had it. Thank God. Um, yeah. uh, and my wife hadn't had it either. We've been around a lot of people that have, I mean, a lot of, uh, family members and a lot of. My fellow musicians have, have, have had it, actually. Uh, most of them have done pretty well. We've lost a few here and there. We were just, you know, uh, talking about Charlie Pride and, yeah. and uh, what, what he meant to me. Of course, Harold Reed passed away back in April but uh, last year, but he didn't pass away from COVID. He, he passed away from, uh, from uh, kidney disease. Um, but it's been a, a tough year. We started out last year. We we're going to be a lockdown. They were saying maybe a couple of weeks. And and then um, I started doing a thing called Jimmy Jams on my just on my little on a website here just, just to do some, a song a day. And it started taking off. I, I wound up doing it for three months, a song every day for three months. And, um, and the people were really getting uh, used to it. And we were having a lot of uh, – action on the on the uh on the website itself actually oh, that's great and so um it was going really well and i got to a point where i was uh there was there were so many friends and and stuff that were coming down with covid and it was getting uh, to where i would have to do a dedication 
almost every day for somebody that passed away. And, uh, and it actually got kind of depressing for me because I, I just was kind of falling into that, you know, Hey, there's people dying and there's people suffering and there, and there. And, and so I kind of had to get away from it a little bit. I just had to back off and just kind of let it, let it lay because we, you know, uh, we started, um, uh, people getting sick. Like I said, my father-in-law lost him, uh, uh, right before Christmas this year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we had to spend a lot of time going up there trying to take care of him. So a lot of things kind of took place of, uh, of playing music and trying to get out and play and trying to do things. But the Jimmy Jams things did take off pretty well. And maybe one of these days I'll get back to it. Um, and we'll see what happens. I've had a few shows here and there. Uh, most of my shows since March last year were canceled. Uh, I had a couple on the books for this March, which have gotten canceled now. Yeah. Um, uh, I do have a private show in Florida um, this weekend, so I fly down to Florida and uh, do that, and then come back and actually go to Virginia to spend. Uh, I haven't spent Christmas with my kids this year, so I'm going up to have Christmas with them in Virginia. Oh, nice! Uh, next week. Yeah. So, uh, so we're just trying to, you know, make everything work. But um, but it's been a it's been a pretty wild ride this year. I, mean, I know it has for you all too. Uh, a little bit different here than it is up there, I'm sure. But uh, for the most part, we've all had to had to do what we had to do, you know, to to try to make it. And it looks like we're going to have to go a little while longer. Yeah, it's interesting here in in Canada that I I still don't know someone personally that has COVID yet. Do you, Brian? Um, oh, yeah, I know a couple of people that have had it. Um, no. Jeremy, our, the publicist in Nashville, just got over it. Mickey Gilly. Yeah, but here it. in Canada, though. like um, No, I just saw one guy in Edmonton. That's, that's right. Only- yeah. Um, but yeah, it's funny. I, a lot of American friends I know have had it, but um, it, it's really just kind of really ramping up here um, the last little while. So I think that's that's going to change uh, a lot. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting... You know, it feels like it's it's going to be close to a year now. It's hard to believe that, uh, you know, a couple more months, it's it's going to be a year that we've been in this. And um, <clears throat> The year went by very, very fast. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe we're in 2021 already, but uh, but here we are. And I'm hoping that, <clears throat> you know, that it's uh, better. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of turmoil going on here uh, with the election and things like that. We've had a lot of... Um, uh, you can feel it in the air. It's just different, and yeah. you know, trying to anticipate what's going to happen with the new administra- administration. And uh, I, uh, we're, we're going through a lot of changes. We a lot. I guess we're going to find out a lot here in the next few months as to how it's going to work out. And uh, you know, I just hope and pray that it does work out. You know, for everybody. That um, I just, I, I just hope that we can all get back to. Uh, respecting one another and, you know, being more, um, more kind, you know, to one another. And, and I really look forward to that and I'm hoping that it can happen. Uh, and so, you know, people quit driving wedges between people, you know, and yeah, cause, uh, things are, uh, things can get real personal when it comes to politics and things like that. And I, I've always told my friends and my family, I said, I will never let that come between me and my family or someone I love. Um, so, you know, I try to uh, keep a positive attitude about that and say, hey, you know, <clears throat> no two people feel the same anyway. No. Uh, you just have to respect what somebody else feels if they feel that way. You know, you can't change anybody's mind anyway. But uh, we're hoping that things will get better. And uh, so that's what I'm hoping for anyway for 2021. And, yes, uh, I think we all feel that way. Fingers crossed for sure. Amen. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, we're all so different. I mean, I don't like sushi. So it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm going to take you off Facebook. Or, you know, it's there's so many things that you like and I don't like. And um, but, we, you know, you make it work. Um, for, and I just, reason, for some reason, uh, as human beings, we have it in us that we want everybody to feel the exact way we feel about something, yeah. you know, that's just what we want. And, uh, you know, you're going to find people that are kind of similar, but 
uh, you all, sooner or later you're going to run into some differences somewhere because you, no no two people are alike. But uh, I uh, used to be when my dad and my uncle when they were younger they they kind of differed on politics, but they just loved each other. They would they would rev each other back and forth and make fun of each other. Just kind of you know it was, it was always a joking thing, you know. Yeah. And I wish we could get back to that. It, and I know it's serious, but sometimes we just need to say, you know, you know, laugh about it and, and, and move on, you know, uh, because it is what it is. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, we, we've definitely been through some, some stuff in this last year with uh, seeing things that we never thought we'd ever see before. Yeah. But, uh, but we are uh, working together, you know, with you all in Canada and, the United States, we, we've worked through a lot of, uh, of things together. We really have. And, uh, and we're very fortunate to have, I think, to have Canada near us like this, you know, because we all pull, I, I do feel like we all kind of will pull together and look out for each other. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. You know, our industry has always been uh, the healer with music or live entertainment and all that sort of stuff. And there's nothing more needed today than that, regardless of whether it's COVID or the politics or whatever it happens to be. And that's the problem. I think, I think a lot of this stuff probably wouldn't even exist if we could get people back enjoying the simpler things in life, as you just say, I mean, it's, it's so, it's so missing in our society today. Yeah. I, uh, I had a, a couple of churches that, you know, hired me to come and they, they're, the Louisiana, Texas, whatever. And they were, of course, social distancing, but they were big churches where they could spread out. And, uh, I mean, they were so excited. I mean, you would think, you know, if there might have been a 1,000 people, you would have thought it was 5,000 people out there because they were so loud and clapping and yelling. And, and it was just, uh, uh, they, they were just as happy to, to see us perform as we were to see them sitting in those seats. Yeah. So people are just uh, itching to get back out there and, and to enjoy concerts and things like that. And but the fear, you know, there's a fear there, and uh, and the thing is real. I mean, it's not there's nothing fake about it. It's it's real. And there's certain people, which my age, uh, my age fans are. You know, I'm getting all ages now, but most of my fans come from anywhere from you know 55 to to, to 95, you know, to, I mean, they're just, they're just that way. Yeah. And you can understand, uh, you can understand their fear of, of, Hey, if I get this, uh, I may not be as fortunate as 10 other people that got it. And there's going to be somebody that's going to, it's going to hit them and hit them pretty hard, you know, yeah. but, um, yeah. yeah, but anyway, it's something that we, that we have to try to deal with and, I uh, hope we get this vaccine going and uh, people start feeling comfortable with that. Of course, you know, there's a lot of questions about that to see how that's going to go as well. Um, yeah. But I think it's warmer. This spring starts opening up and summer starts opening. I think, uh, I, I really do think the thing will start getting a little bit better. It will. Yeah. Little by little. Yeah. I think we're in that. Hopefully looking down the road as a, it's going to be an upward swing um, and away we go. So yeah. anyways, let's, let's talk more about uh, Jimmy Fortune, the singer. Obviously one, you really are one of my all time favorite singers ever and absolutely you. love your voice. And it was interesting when you, you performed at her theater and, and uh, asked me to come up and, and do a show with you and play. One one of my greatest moments ever uh, performing uh, was with you and uh, you sang Elizabeth, which is just an unbelievably great song that you wrote. And I saw, and I just still remember sitting there playing with. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, "Gee, I'm I'm sitting here playing with Jimmy Fortune, who who wrote one of my favorite songs." And I'm playing away, <laughs> and and it came to the break, and you just kind of looked over and. You know, take the break. And I was just like, it was one of those moments that I'll never forget. Um, and I remember looking over to the right um, where I usually sit. It's at the, the sound console. And my sister, Kim, was just sitting there watching over things for me. I look over and she's got tears just coming down her eyes. You know, 
And oh. uh, it was just like, okay, I can't look at you. <laughs> but honestly, as a musician, it was one of my greatest moments ever. And I just wanted to share that with you and, and thank you for having me up. And um, I don't know what it was. It was just, it was a special time and, and I just loved performing with you and, and having that opportunity. So, so first of all, thank you for, for that. You're, you're very welcome and you're awfully kind to say that, uh, that song, you know, it continues to, uh, to do things today that I can't even explain. I had somebody, uh, texted me a little while ago. Uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, William Lee Golan's, uh, granddaughter, uh, texted me and her name's Elizabeth. And, She's named that because of that song. And William Lee Golden of the Oak Ridge Boys, it's his granddaughter. Yeah. And uh, she's a teacher. And she said, uh, she had her students there, and she sent me a little video of them. They were talking about songs and names, songs with names, you know, like uh, Elvira, uh, or whatever, you know, and Elizabeth, and, and all these, uh, other, uh, Jolene, and yeah. things like that. Well, uh, she played Elizabeth for them, and the kids have fallen in love with it. So uh, they want me to come perform it for them at the school oh, nice. in the next few days. And so I'm thinking about doing that. But that song, you talk about the uh, God thing in my life. I mean, there was Stouter Brothers, early 80s, um, they were going through a transition of uh, Ludwig being there. He wrote Flowers on the Wall, a lot of great songs, and he, he was one of the top songwriters uh in that era and of course flowers on the wall is one of the biggest songs ever it was pop song it's on yeah. country charts and pop and uh so i knew that um uh, going into um i never had written a song with this before i went to the Saddle brothers i was i wanted to try to make a place for myself because i knew that lou wrote songs he wasn't going to be there anymore so so i had to not take his place make a place for myself so i thought well Maybe if I write a song, they record it. And and he's, uh, this God thing happened in my life that God gave me the song and said, here, you know, this is a uh, a beautiful name. Here's and, he, and I had this melody in my head, and I started putting it all together, and I thought, Elizabeth, hey, how many how many families do you know have someone named Elizabeth? Yeah. I even had like three in my family named Elizabeth. And it's such a beautiful name anyway. And so the melody and lent itself to harmony. So we put it together, and it was magic. I mean, it just took off. It became like a a household uh, song for a long for a lot of years. Wow. And uh, so it's still living right today. Daly and Vincent recorded it about five years ago. It uh, was nominated for a Grammy, oh. and uh, it didn't win. But I'm always telling them, hey, it was nominated, but it didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie loves it when I rub that in his face, but uh, <laughs> but it was nominated. That, I mean, that's pretty cool, you know. After all these years to have a song like that, that's no kidding. still living. Um, but people like you, you know, saying that how much you love it and and you stand on stage with me, I have had those moments uh, with with a lot of my heroes and a lot of uh, people that that I love that standing on stage, uh, Glenn Campbell and Jerry Reed and. Uh, so many others that they just stand on stage with Reba McIntyre, uh, Alan Jackson, and you're standing there with so these people, and you're going, "How? How did I get here? I mean, this is just unreal." Yeah. And uh, and of course, with Harold Field and Don the Stout Brothers, I, I stood on stage with them every night, and I thought because they were my some of my childhood heroes. Uh, growing up and there I was standing on stage with them couldn't explain how or why it happened uh, but all these God things that happened in my life and uh, these that's what music does music brings people together music uh, uh, just uh, it, it's, it's magical it's spiritual yeah. and uh, and you feel it just like you felt it that night I, I mean I felt very special that you came up wanted to play with me and you very played very well too. I mean, I mean, I just don't let anybody come up and play with me. <laughs> <laughs> I could hear when we started playing, I said, yeah, yeah, he, he, he's a great player. And, uh, you know, cause sometimes you can get yourself in a mess every once in a while, you know, yeah. Yeah, but, oh, I know. but, uh, but you were very good and very kind to come up and do it. Thanks. So let's go back. How, 
how did you get into music? How how young were you when you kind of started singing and, and playing? Um, as far back as I can remember, my family sang. I'm number seven of nine children. Oh, wow. And uh, I would we'd sing in churches sometimes and uh, with families. Like I said, you'd, you'd go to church, you'd get up there and sing, and sometimes it was all of us singing at the same time. So you were jumping around parts and all that. I knew I knew how to sing parts. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what it was all about. I just knew that I heard harmonies, and we would get together. It was nothing structured at all. Nobody taught anybody anything. We just got up and did it, you know. And I thought everybody could sing, and I found out when I was about six years old, standing next to this, this man came in, standing next to me in church. I was standing by my mom singing. And this man opened his mouth, and it was the most ungodly sound coming out of his mouth that you'd ever heard. And I was like, Tell him, I said, Mama, that man's sick. Something's wrong with him. And she told me, uh, taught me a valuable lesson that day. She said, now, son, God's given you a gift. It's a gift to be able to sing. This man doesn't know how to sing. He probably has another gift. I don't know what it is. but. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember uh, she was saying he was making a joyful noise to the Lord, and that was okay. And I, and I said something like, well, it's a noise, but it's sure not joyful. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I realized at that moment that not everybody could sing. So I'm realizing that it's a gift and that it's something that God gave me. So um, I got uh, found a guitar when I was, uh, there was a place, we, when I say we were poor, we were really poor. We lived beside a river, and where the river was, right across from the river, uh, Across the river was a dump that people dumped their trash and stuff down by the river. Yeah. And whenever uh, I would go over that, sometimes I'd go in that dump. I'd find a lot of toys that I played with. I found I found a little plastic guitar with two strings on it when I was about eight years old. Wow. And I took that guitar home and uh, I started playing on those two strings, just playing little melodies and things. And um, I had that for about four years. And then when I was twelve. Uh, Christmas 1967, my mom and dad scraped up, saved up $52 to buy me a, a, a harmony guitar and uh, for Christmas. Yeah. And uh, at that time, there was groceries and uh, groceries and rent for, you know, for for us for a month probably at that yeah. time. And uh, so I knew it was hard for mom and dad to come up with that money, but I remember seeing that guitar that day and I I held that guitar and I told my dad I said if I can learn to play and sing that at the same time I'm, I'm going to make a living it it's what I want to do to make a living and he told me I was crazy he said you can't make a living playing music he said why do you think they call it playing <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I said uh, you know I understood but I, I never did take his advice on much of anything i I wish I had, because I found out how, how right my dad was about a lot of things. But that's one time I'm glad I just followed my heart, you know, that I went with the music. And I started playing. A year later, I had a little band, and we played. started playing PTA meetings. Uh, made first gig with PTA meeting in Livingston, Virginia, where I, where I grew up, that area. Uh, made a dollar piece. Wow. And four of us. And uh, I told my dad we were on our way. And uh, so my goal was to one day make a hundred dollars in in a week, you know. <laughs> and so uh, it went on, uh, you know, for years. I was playing high school dances and things like that. And eventually, I got out into the clubs, playing Sheraton Inns, Ramada Inns, Holiday Inns, and things like that around Virginia and colleges. And yeah. I was into all kinds of music. I didn't. It wasn't one kind of music. It was country. It was rock. It was bluegrass. It was gospel. It was um, you know, uh, even went through the disco era. We went had a disco band, nine piece disco band, <laughs> pop, playing pop music, cover music. I love to see uh, that. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I'm writing a book right now. I'm about four years into it, so it'll have all those groups in it. And it'll tell the names of everybody and tells a few stories here and there. Nice. Um, but uh, but it made for some interesting stories because. Uh, there were a lot of different groups that I was in. I played six nights a week, four hours a night for for a lot of years. Wow! And I had a um, uh, daytime. Usually kept a daytime jobs 
most of the time, sometimes two daytime jobs to to work to support my music habit that I had. Uh, but uh, it was just something that I had to do. And I, I was willing to do it because I loved it so much. But I did that for a lot of years until the Stout Brothers hired me when I was uh, 26 years old. And uh, I, of all things, it was the night before Thanksgiving. I was off in 1981, and some friends were having a jam session at a, at a local ski resort back home in Virginia. And I, of all things, went to do that on my night off. I went to play music. And wow. um, Lou DeWitt happened to be there that night, and he heard me sing and play. And we met, and then... Uh, I didn't know he was sick at the time. He had Crohn's disease, but he was going to have to be out for about six months. And uh, he, they said, who do you think can fill in for you? He said, well, I know I heard a guy, a young man from just across the mountain uh, uh, that's not too far from here. That He said, this boy sings pretty good. He said, I think he could fill in for me if y'all want to give him a chance. And so they kind of, it's a long story, but. They they wound up bringing me over, talking to me, and through through a process of, uh, of coming to Nashville and recording some and listening to it and back and forth, they they hired me in uh, 1982, January 1982. That's amazing. It it kind of goes to show. I always say that no matter where you're playing and for how many people and wherever it could be, there could always be that one person there that can change your life. And you should never phone it in. You should never just kind of think twice about whatever you're doing. Always make every gig and every show you do the best it could be because you just never know who could be there. And it's, it just needs to be one person. Um, and it could be at the strangest place too. So, um, but yeah. You're right. Uh, I, I mean, I couldn't explain those things there because there was, uh, I think my work ethic and just staying with it is probably what did it because uh, there's so many people that are so much more talented than I am really. But, um, I just got, uh, like I said, I was at the right place, the right time. Sometimes you just need that break. And I think there's a lot of talent out there today. I hear people that just blow me away all the time. And, uh, I go, man, what are you doing here? You know, it's kind of like the Billy Joel song, you know, uh, the piano man. I mean, you, know, you ask him, what are you doing here? Well, it just, they hadn't got that break yet, you know? Yeah. Uh, and there are so many people out there. What I always say is so rewarding. The, just the satisfaction of doing what you love to do is more rewarding than the monetary end of it. But sometimes the monetary end comes with it and you can make a living and you can do well. Some people, but breaking through um, through that is is um, not. I mean, not many people actually get to do that. You know, it's a it's a privilege. It's a blessing. It's a it's such a uh, uh, it's something to really be thankful for. And I am thankful for it because I I uh, can't explain it sometimes. But uh, you know, you you made it to a certain level in your field and. Uh, that's that's just a pretty good feeling, and and I think it was hard work and dedication more than it was. You have to have some talent, I think. Oh yeah. But I think sometimes it's more hard work and dedication, and uh, passion. Yeah. I don't want to ever lose the passion. If I lose the passion for what I do, then I think it's time to just say, okay, let it go, you know. But I hope that I have that passion until the day I die, you know. Yeah, I'm sure you will. You you can tell you're the type that. There's just certain types of people who, who have a lot of passion and they're driven and they work super hard at what they do. And, and it always seems though, if you talk to all those people at the top, um, whether it's in business or music, or whatever, they put a lot of time into it. It's, there's not too many people who just, you know, don't practice or don't spend a lot of time at their craft and make it to the top. It's always the story of, you know, the hours and hours and hours spent um, and it takes takes that time to make it happen. Yeah, and 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 getting in front of people too. Like I said, sometimes you can people sit and uh, they go to their room and they practice, and that's great. You know, they practice, practice, practice in the room or by themselves. 
but you don't really know what happens when you go out and all of a sudden you get in front of people and you start playing and they start moving or you start moving them emotionally, spiritually, physically, you're moving them, you know, you're, and then all of a sudden it, it goes from just be you and the music inside of you. It goes out to them and it, and then they share in it yeah. and then it starts coming back. It's like a feeding thing. It's like going them to you and you to them. Otherwise, if you sit in your room and just practice, you don't get out and do it. You don't get that feeling. Uh, I had to make myself, you know, when I wanted to, when I was, you know, when I got that guitar, I, I made myself get in front of people sometimes. And I made mistakes. I fell on my face. I, I did. I, I just, but I went out and tried to memorize. I didn't really know how to read music or anything like that. I, I leaned on my ear for everything. And uh, I would memorize songs and learn songs and learn the chords. I didn't really have anybody to show me it uh, at the time. I put a record on and listen to it and try to pick, you know, my way through it and try to figure things out. Yeah. But that's, that's how I learned, you know, we didn't have, um, you know, we didn't have a computer we didn't have a certain way, but I think you, you find ways, you know, to, to do it if you don't have the tools, you know, yeah. Uh, I that, that old guitar for a long time, the strings were that high off the neck and I would play it and, you know, just beat the crap out of it. Just trying to, you know, we didn't even have a PA when we started. We just got out there and just started playing and just, and then you had to sing loud. So you had to sing strong. So it made you work hard, you know, and I think it kind of paid off. Wow. What about your very first show with the Statlers? Uh, where was that and, and how did that go? It was uh, January the 28th, um, 1982 in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, I, I, if I remember right, it was about, I don't know, it looked like about eight or 10,000 people um, in an in a, uh, arena. And, and that was like one of my first trips, like anywhere. And, and I just remember it being so beautiful and seeing the palm trees down there, my first trip. And uh, I, I remember that night uh, knowing, feeling that I was ready because they made it. I knew the songs. Harold and Don did the comedy and talked all that. I didn't have to really say anything, so I had to worry about that. Yeah. All I had to do was sing my part and do what I did and uh, play my guitar. And so that part of it was easy for me. Uh, but I remember looking across stage and saying, man, I'm standing up here with uh, these guys that I've listened to most of my life, and uh, and I'm actually singing with them, you know, and remembering how just how wonderful it felt and how um, I just felt like I was a part of something so much bigger than I could imagine, you know. Yeah. And it stayed that way until until they uh, had their last date in October the 26th, um, 2002. Wow. Salem, Virginia. So, um, that, but it went by like a flash. Honest to God, it was like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, How did it feel like coming in and, and, you know, being the replacement for a guy that's been there? And, and did you feel pressure or did you feel like the audience wasn't going to accept you did you have those feelings or did it this seem, seem to go pretty smooth at first you know it was uh, temporary because they they thought when they knew that lou was coming back he was going to be out have surgery they told everybody that and i and i uh i knew that as well yeah i just knew that this was kind of a break for me and that i had uh, no matter what I was going to do whatever they needed me to do to help them make it till he came back. And, um, uh, I had a, a couple of, uh, record labels that had contacted me about, you know, when he comes back, what, what was I going to do? And they would want to sit down and talk with me at some point if, uh, if Lou came back and uh, so I could maybe pursue something there, you know, uh, well, I knew I had my foot in the door. I knew yeah. things were working pretty good. And so, um, uh, at first it was temporary, then it got to, that was in January and it worked up until, uh, the last part of June. 
uh, we came off the road and, uh, and we were, I told them, I would, they asked me if I'd stay in the band for a while uh, to find out how Lou was going to do to build their stuff up. And if they needed to step in, I could, yeah. if I would stay for a while, I said, yeah, sure. And, uh, so Lou came back for a couple of weeks and practiced. And, uh, and so, um, he, uh, came to me after about a week and said, he said, I don't think I can do this anymore. He said, he said, you've done a great job up to this point. And he said, why don't you just, you just become one of the Sattler brothers full time. And I was like, are you sure that's what you want? And he said, yeah. And, uh, I, and I, I was like, I, I said, thank you. And he said, and he told me, he said, I don't know if I'm doing you any favors or not. <laughs> <laughs> because he knew that it was different. It was, it's, it's a lot of uh, glamour and glitz and glamour and stuff like that. But it's also, it's also different too. All of a sudden you, you are in the public eye all the time and you, you, you give up a certain amount of your, your, uh, your freedom and yourself and your and you and you give up a certain amount to your family you know because you all of a sudden you belong to to the people and so to speak and and to the music and so it was different but um uh, i told him i said you know the all gave y'all gave me a break i told the other brothers harold phil and don you gave me a break and i said uh as long as y'all need me um i'll be here and uh and there were times when uh yeah, when uh, and I'm sure there are times now. Even I'll see, I'll see comments every once in a while. Uh, people that don't like me because I came in to to in, in a place of Lou. And I never wanted to to do that. It just all kind of happened by accident. Yeah, I came in to help out, and then all of a sudden it got laid in my lap. Uh, I never wanted to come into a group and take somebody else's place. I never wanted that kind of thing to happen. And then all of a sudden you were there to help. And then all of a sudden it turns into, well, now you're here for good. And so when people would come through the autograph line, uh, you know, they would get to me and sometimes they would just walk around me to the other guys, you know, and, yeah. and I would always say, you know, Hey, I understand. It's okay. And it went through that kind of a thing for a little while. And then after a while it was, it was totally, you know, I had people accepting me and all around me, and and it was it was moving on. But I'm I'm sure there are people out there today, you know, that are fans of Lou's, that are not necessarily fans of mine. Um, but that's what you go through when you go through um, something like that. But I never intended to to take his place. Uh, I uh, said, and I told him, I said, you know, I'm not going to take your place. You will always be the first tenor of this group. I will be the second tenor of this group. Yeah, uh, that's the way I approached it because uh, I just felt it was important that I didn't take his place. That I made a place for myself, and so that's what I tried to do. And I think I think it worked because of that. Oh yeah. Were some, some of those tours pretty long? Did you go up for three or four months at a time? No, we never did. We would go for. Uh, I think the longest we were ever out was about three weeks at, at one time. Perfect length of time. <laughs> they, they made it, uh, they made it, um, a priority that we, uh, got to spend time with family and I always admired them for that. And we never worked more than about 120 days in a year. And most of those were like, you go out on a week, uh, go out on a Wednesday and come back on a Sunday or, or Monday and, you'd have a few days during the week to be with your family. Yeah. And then we always took off the whole month of July and we always took off the month of December and a couple of weeks in January. That's when we went back to work. So we always had that time to be with the family and plan things with the family. That's good. What about uh, as far as it goes to recording and uh, albums and making decisions for that. How did that work within the Statler brothers? How did you figure out what songs to record and, and what to make the next album? We had a, uh, a system called a four star system and we would listen to songs. And if we wrote a song, we'd bring it in and play it. Don wrote a song. He'd bring it in and play it. Harold had a song he or something he and Don had written. And then we, if we found songs from somewhere else, 
we would we would bring it in and listen to the song, and then all four of us would say, "Okay, if say it was uh, Elizabeth, and uh, if I said, okay, I gave it uh, a three star, and uh, Don, if I remember right, I gave I gave that song a two and a half star. That tells you what I knew. <laughs> two and a half, and Don gave it a four, and Harold gave it a four. And Phil, I think, gave it a two and a half, I believe it was. But, um, but anyway, we wound up recording it. That's how it, it worked. Yeah. And Don just wrote a book, uh, the Stout Brothers Anthology, and it's, t- it's about every song was recorded, how it was recorded, stories behind it. Wow. All the musicians that played on it. Um, if you get a chance to get that book, it's very, very interesting. And the yeah. record that he did was was unbelievable i mean it was just so good i mean he, he he's a very brilliant man and he did a wonderful job with that book but um but he saved some of those those uh those great sheets i call them for the songs he saved some of those he has those in the book as well oh, neat. and how many stars we gave what song and this that and the other but that's kind of the way we made it work and then we the ones that got the most stars wind up on the uh, album. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the way to do it. <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So now what? About, go ahead. Democratic, anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you have to be right um, because it's you know it's a it's a group, um, but you know some groups it's just one one person who makes all the decisions and and uh, yeah. that's it. But it's nice when it's a real mm-hmm. true group effort uh, makes right. sense. It's interesting with the Statlers that um, you guys never came back and did a reunion tour or anything. Was there ever ever talks about that or when it was done, it was done and that was final? Yeah, um, I was surprised too, but um, I mean, they uh, called us together in January 2002 said this would be the last year, the uh, um, October the 26th in Salem, Virginia, would be the last day when they were going to retire. And uh, I uh, I got got the mindset of, hey, I got to figure things out here because I'm not, I'm not in really a shape to retire, and I don't want to retire. I want to keep on going because I felt like I still had a lot of gas in the tank, you know, that I could, that I could still perform and still do things. And, yeah. I knew that I didn't want to put together another group because I didn't want it to compete with the Staten Brothers. I just figured that I could go out and make a living, at least make a living, you know, on my own doing what I do. And um, and I didn't have to to have a whole lot of overhead and a lot of people I had to take care of and a lot of things. So I had to start small and see where it led me. Um, but, um, but that was a, uh, you know, just you know, starting over again. You know, after they said they were going to retire, yeah, uh, uh, it was it was tough. But you know, they knew when they retired. They always said, "If we retire, that's going to be it. We're not going to be going back out there and doing a, a, another farewell tour or another one." Then they didn't. They stuck to their, they stuck to what they said. And um, I think uh, actually Harold was. Uh, Let's see, I'm 65 now, so he was three years younger than me when they retired. Oh, yeah. He's three years younger than I am now when they retired. And her, Phil was the same age. And then Don was, um, you know, uh, let's see, he was 57. So um, he was, uh, you know, about um, eight years younger than, than I am now or whatever. Yeah. Retired. And... Uh, so that's that's uh, they got to retire at a young age. They got to enjoy their families and, and and everything and and do what they wanted to do. And they they made enough money and they won enough awards and did all they wanted to do. Um, now I, on the other hand, I I don't feel like I've uh, I've done well. I don't feel like I've uh, if I I feel like whenever I quit, it's going to be the day that I can't do it anymore. Yeah. You know? And because uh, I, I, I just have the, I think I just have a, a love and a passion for it that, that I can't even explain, you know. Uh, but if I got to where, oh my gosh, I got to stick my hands in my ears and 
I'm not hitting my notes and I'm not playing well anymore, then I'll know it's time to say, hey, I'm going to let the, I'll let the young cats have it and <laughs> take it on, you know. Um, but I have, I do take a lot of uh, musicians here in town. I take them with me on the road and I got some great musicians that I can, that I take out there with me and that, that have, that have done really well. And, and I get to pick with some of the best in the world. And it's pretty, it's pretty cool so that I to still get to do that. Yeah. I, I see uh, Janae plays fiddle with you sometimes. Uh, yeah. she, she's pretty fabulous. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, she is something else, man. Uh, she amazes me. Uh, matter of fact, I mean, she, she's one of those people I call that are eat up with it. She is eat up with playing and she has mastered, she's mastered that instrument. Yeah. And, I mean, I just sit and watch her in amazement. And, uh, and of course, we've had uh, Ryan Joseph. He plays with me quite a bit, and he does a really, really good job. He plays for Alan Jackson as well. Of course, Janae plays on The Voice and plays for Blake Shelton and uh, Steven Tyler. She plays for so many other people. Yeah. And um, a guy named Mike Rogers comes out and plays with me quite a bit. Uh, I've just kind of got a lot of different people I pull from. Uh, from time to time, John Meyer, uh, he's coming on really uh, a lot. I'm trying to push him to being a a, uh, a solo artist himself because he's writing some of the greatest songs that I've heard in a long time. Wow. And I'm really proud of his new album he's got out. So I've been really pushing him to. Uh, so these kids that are coming along, I try to push them and and uh, into the right direction and try to give them good advice and use me as a stepping stone, so to speak, to, to maybe to take that next level, to go out and be with those, those big artists that are out there on the road. Uh, I had another girl, uh, Sydney Perry, that was with me for five years. And, uh, now she's with Carrie Underwood singing for Carrie. Nice. And, um, so I see these kids come through and they take these next steps and go further and further and further. And it makes me so proud of them. And, uh, and I feel like that I'm getting to uh, kind of help help them take these little steps to the next level, you know. Yeah. What is what was it like uh, once you had left with the Statler brothers? They retired, and you're out on your own. Um, was it difficult trying to weave now your Jimmy Fortune, not Jimmy of the Statler brothers, and? Um, what was that like to to navigate um, once you were well, doing all that? Because you know, you think, well, you're coming from a group like Stout Brothers and the most awarded act in the history of country music. Then all of a sudden, you're standing there. You don't have any jokes to tell. You don't have anything but a few songs that you've written. And to get out here and stand in front of people at the time, it was just me and a guitar. And uh, the Stout Brothers, I mean, uh, the Oak Ridge Boys found out that I was going on my own and they came along and took me and said, Hey, why don't you come out and open a few shows for us on the road? Do you get your feet wet just to see. And it scared me to death because I went out, we we're in Ohio doing a concert and, uh, I went out on the stage, uh, I don't know, a few thousand people out there. I'm standing there by myself. And I looked down at my legs, and my legs were shaking so bad I couldn't. It was like a blur, you know, <laughs> shake. Yeah. And I'm trying to sing the first song, and I'm like, I was so scared that I thought, I'm going to set my guitar down and just tell these people, you know, hey, that I, I just can't do this. Because I literally was so nervous. And uh, I, all of a sudden, these, uh, these apples come rolling out from the side of the stage and stopping right at my feet. I'm like, what in the world? I look down. And the people just start laughing and start clapping and whatever. I look over and Joe Bonds was rolling those apples out there at my feet. And uh, and he's like, he could see that I was nervous. And I told him I was really nervous. So he, he started doing that when it broke the tension and everything. And I started laughing and I was okay. And I went on and I did. So later on, I thanked him for throwing those, the, or rolling those apples out there. And he said, he said, I wasn't doing it to help you. I was doing it to mess you up because you were doing too good. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so I did that for a while, and um, so when whenever the Stadabos asked me what I was going to do after after retire after they retired, um, the group retired, I uh, I said you know I wanted to continue on, but I was scared and I didn't know what to do, 
And um, Don gave me really good advice. He said, well, he said, Jimmy, when you when you came through the door and you came in and introduced yourself and said, told us who you were and we, we heard you sing and we heard you play, we said, we loved you. And you weren't trying to be anybody else. You just, he said, what you have to do is just be yourself when you walk out on that stage, no matter what it is, don't try to be anybody else. And people will love you for who you are and what you are. Yeah. And so that was the best advice anybody could ever give me because, you know, I'm just a simple person and, um, and a thankful person to be doing what I'm doing. And I think that comes through that, you know, you're thankful to be there. Sometimes you sit there and go, how did I get here? How am I? But you, you have a song to play that might, somebody else might sit there and say, Hey, that, that song was written for me. Uh, or, you know, and that's what, that's what it's all about. You, you do it to, to, to affect someone, to move someone else emotionally. And when you start doing that, then that's when you become, I think, uh, an entertainer and an artist. Yeah, for sure. It, it's interesting because as a buyer from a bunch of years ago, um, you saw Jimmy Fortune. It's like, oh, Jimmy from the Statler Brothers. Um, but now when I look at Jimmy Fortune, I just see Jimmy Fortune. Um, mm. And it's it's great to see how you've really just established yourself so well. Um, and, and you really are super respected in the industry. Um, and it's it's a difficult thing to separate yourself from being with someone like the Statler brothers, such a huge act. Um, yeah. but you, 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 but you were really, you've been really successful and, and really making Jimmy fortune an artist all among itself. And it's, you know, it's, it's congratulate Perfect. you on that. That's a really good. Thank job. you. Thank you for saying that. Um, I knew that, um, when you have a purpose, you know, and I, be, I, be, uh, I, cause I had some time there where I was going out and, People were taking me to labels and stuff like that, labels downtown, Mercury, uh, Capital, um, RCA, and they were taking you in and they were saying, we don't, and they, they would just look at you and say, no, we don't need that. We, and you know, it, it kind of made me feel feel really bad and I felt defeated for, for a long time. And, uh, and I, I just kept trying, I kept trying to do, cause I felt like I've got something to say and uh, I wanted my message to be a positive message that, hey, I'm 50 years old, but hey, when you're 50 years old, it doesn't mean that life's over. If you have love in your heart for what you do, there, there's, uh, you know, there's always a way, and people will pick up on that. And, and so I remember coming out of uh, a label downtown, and I was supposed to have a meeting, and uh, one of the last ones I went to, and uh, had my manager. I was, Marshall Grant was the Statler manager too. He's my manager at the time, and uh, we just came out, and they were like, "No, we're not interested." And uh, and I mean, not pulling any punches. It was like, "Yeah, you were here, and you did this, and you did that, but that you're 50 year old man, and you you just we just not interested." So I remember walking out, standing on the side of the street that day, and. Uh, and I just, Marshall had walked off and he, he was leaving and, and I just told him, I said, Marshall, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to, I mean, I'm going to continue to play, but I'm not going to go to these labels and, and put myself out there to be beat up. I'm just not going to do that. And I stood there and it was literally, it was literally like God was talking to me and I was looking up and I was looking around at the buildings and he said, these words just came to me. Don't worry about these big buildings. Don't worry about these record companies. Uh, you just put one foot in front of the other. Do what I ask you to do. Be positive. Do the right thing. And I'll take care of you. And I walked away from that point. And then all things started just coming my way. Little things here and there. Building building, and little fires starting here and there. And then eventually one fire became another and another. And, and it became a, a building over the last, well, it's been 18 years now, 18 years this year. Yeah. And uh, it's taken a while. I won't say it hadn't, but uh, 
but you're right. My music's out there. My purpose is out there. The whole goal of what I set out to do. I didn't want the Statler Brothers to die. This is a piece of the Statler Brothers. This is a piece of it that's still living. That's still out there. When people people hear me play and they come, Statler fans come and they hear a little piece of what the Statler Brothers had, and then um, it's it's just something that's living. I always like to say something that's great that comes along and then all of a sudden it dies and it's gone. I always like to see something living come from that. Just like a, just like a, a plant or a tree. It's like that, that tree needs, needs to go on. It, it, that tree might, might die out one day, but then the seed that falls from that tree will grow another tree and it'll be. Yeah. So I felt like I was that, you know, pulling what the Statler brothers were. And, and I still, talk about the guys today and just praise them over and over again because of what they did for me and what they've done for so many their music i don't want it to die so i i try to keep it living and in, a, in the process i try to create new music and try to create positive music because i promised god that whatever i did with my music would be positive yeah. and maybe be something that would help somebody along the way they said well if jimmy fortune can do it then i can do it you know uh that's the way i wanted it to be so I appreciate you saying that because it, it, it has been a long journey, but it has been a very rewarding journey. I've, I've probably enjoyed music in the last uh, in the last 15 years more than I ever have in my life. Yeah, that's good. And, and I, I feel like I'm learning, and, and I feel like every day that I learn something, I, got, I feel like there's, there's so much more to learn. And... I never want to stop feeling that feeling, you know, uh, of learning yeah. to do something. That's important for sure. It's interesting, you know, I, I was thinking with with the Statlers, uh, obviously Daly and Vincent do a great job of, you know, bringing back a lot of those songs. But besides that, there's not a lot of Statler Brother tribute type shows. There's a couple I've seen here and there. Um, but you know, I, I thought for sure it, it's it's not an easy thing to do. That's the um, the thing about trying to do a Statler Brothers tribute. Those songs are hard. I, I even know with the family sometimes. Well, let's do a Statler Brothers song, and and we start practicing and say, "Holy smokes, this is this singing. It, it's difficult <laughs> stuff to pull off. It's it, it seems like the songs roll by pretty quick, but those are those are some heavy shoes to fill in. Those are pretty tough harmonies." Uh, Jamie Daly's one of the biggest fans of the Stout Brothers has ever been. He's a big, big fan of, of all of us and Darren too. But they, they put together a thing. I sang with them from time to time and it's really, really cool. They got, uh, they've had a couple of great bass singers that they used. And, um, and it's just, uh, the tribute album that they did to us was so good. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's tremendous. Yeah. And they still do quite a few, uh, Statler songs and, uh, uh, I'll do them on the Opry because they they own the Opry now. They they belong. Uh, they joined the Opry here a few years ago, and um, and so I've I've done some quite a few shows with them. I just finished doing some Christmas shows with them, and this past year, and then I did uh, a new Valentine show that'll be coming up here pretty soon. Um, and then we're working on some other things together. Um, but uh, but yeah, those guys are, are just great. Uh, uh, there's one story I need to tell you, though. Oh, yeah. You were talking, I'll drop back just a little bit. You were talking about how hard it was to be at, uh, on the road after the Statler Brothers. Uh, one of the first places I went was upstate New York. Uh, somebody asked me to come to a fair. Yeah. Uh, I went up there, and I pulled up to the fair. I got my Suburban or whatever, my trailer on the back of it with my stuff in it. And I asked him, I said, where do I go? I said, Jimmy Fortune, and we're, I'm doing a show tonight. I said, yeah, you, you go through this gate, you go across the tracks, and the grandstands are out there. So I pull up to the gate, gate opens up. I pull across the track, and I looked at the grandstand, and there's two speakers on sticks and a microphone sitting in the middle of the ro- of the, uh, of the <laughs> race track. Yeah. <laughs> and a microphone sitting there, and that's it. And <laughs> Band of about that would hold a hundred thousand people looks like I mean probably twenty thousand yeah but um, it would only we only had a hundred people there that night 
And so when I'm standing there, I told the guy, I said, well, where do I go to get dressed? He said, well, your dressing room will be here in just a minute. <laughs> so I, look, I looked up at that place where I just came through. And there was a truck with a horse trailer on the back of it. Coming, I said, oh, so I said, I guess that's my dressing room. He said, yep. <laughs> and they pulled it down there, and they didn't even bother to clean it out. I mean, that dude, <laughs> I had to get in there and dress. I'm like, God, where are the staff of the brothers? Where? I mean, it was like reality hit me, and it was like, what in the world have I got myself into here? I And not only that, while I'm doing my concert, there was a demolition derby going on behind that grandstand. <laughs> And it was packed with people. I mean, it must have been a thousand people. It was packed. And all you could hear was that car, those cars going back and forth. And I'm standing up there singing as loud and hard as I can uh, to those hundred people. And I said, why did you have me come up here? He said, well, I'm a big fan of yours. I just wanted you to come, the guy that ran the fair. Yeah. He thought you'd come. I said, well, well, next time have a little mercy on me. Don't let, at least don't let the demolition derby go on while I'm playing my music. <laughs> Well, that's funny. I love that story. <laughs> but, but I just had to tell you that story. But uh, but back to, to, to the Stadler brothers and Daly and Vincent, uh, they uh, are just tremendous. And uh, they've done a lot for the Stadler brothers to keep their name going. And, I, and they've done a lot for me, too. They've recorded a lot of my songs along the way. As I said, uh, they took Elizabeth and uh, uh, took it. Uh, they were nominated for a Grammy. Uh, few, few, some years back, yeah. and uh, so so many other songs that they they did so well, and they still do it today. So um, we 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 got to thank those guys a lot for because they're they're some great singers, man. Jamie Daly, man, he can sing he can sing tenor to a dog whistle, man. He's he, <laughs> I mean, he's a guy, man. Yeah, oh yeah, oh, that's good. So, yeah. Well, we'll wrap up on. Uh, a couple more questions here. I, I'm curious with all your time with the Statlers, do you have a particular show or date that stands out to you as being, you know, this is one of the best shows we did, or maybe it was a place that stands out to you, or sometimes you have those special moments. <clears throat> well, this, the two of the most special moments were, were the first time I stood on stage with them in Savannah, Georgia. Yeah. And I looked across the stage. I could not believe I was standing there. And then the last show that we did in uh, Salem, Virginia, October the 26th, 2002, those two dates stand out. They were emotional for me. They were uh, just couldn't believe that the snap of a finger. And I'd played through all those years with some of my heroes and, and some of the people that uh, I never thought I'd ever get to meet. Uh, we, I remember... I was a big fan of Glenn Campbell. We did the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour. Did his show with him. Uh, got to meet him and pick with him and Jerry Reed on the same stage, wow. um, and that was a that was a, a quite a a treat. We got to meet uh, with President Reagan at the White House and the Oval Office a few times uh, and get to know him. And it was a, quite a treat. We got to go out to L.A. where uh, to we started the Dare program with uh, President Reagan. So we would get to go travel sometime and do some, some uh, galas with him yeah. and, uh, and, and, and uh, the first lady, Mrs. Reagan. And um, I remember uh, uh, we, we, we would just get to do things that you can only say, I used to watch it on TV at home with my dad and we were so far from that. We're like, it's like another planet. There's no way you're ever going to get there. You're never going to be able to touch these people or talk to them. There, all of a sudden, I'm out there with them. And uh, I remember going out to L.A. to do the thing for the D.A.R.E. program out there. And it was every actor and actress and every musician, singer, entertainer was out there that night. And I was a big Jimmy Stewart fan. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to meet Jimmy Stewart. And, uh, but I was one of those people that kind of sat back and I was like, I didn't want to bother anybody. And I was just like kind of just taking it in, just watching everybody. So, um, and so I had to go to the bathroom. Eventually, I had to go to the bathroom, right? So I get up from my table and go to the bathroom, and uh, I'm standing there <laughs> at the urinal. <laughs> 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 yeah. And 
been standing ne- right next to me, and I seen him out of the corner of my eye. I'm like, oh, my God, it's Frank Sinatra. And he said, he looked right at, like he looked at me and said, well, Jim, what do you think about this? And I was like, Frank Sinatra knows who I am? What are you? And, and before I could say anything, to my left, I hear this, yeah, it's a pretty big deal out here tonight. And, and it was Jimmy Stewart on the other side of me. <laughs> And I'm sitting there going, all of a sudden, man, I'm like, holy smoke. So <laughs> I said, I'm never going to get the chance again. So, so I, I, but could course, you pee? <laughs> <laughs> Did you have stage fright in there? <laughs> I said, I said, Mr. Stewart, I said, I, I'm a big fan of yours. I, I, I would, I'm so honored to meet you. And I stuck my hand out. Like he said, you wouldn't mind washing it first for me, son. I said, <laughs> <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> and then both of them walked out and they're standing they walked out talking i'm standing there with my mouth of one oh my <laughs> Stuart frank sinatra and uh so you never know who you're gonna meet in the bathroom but <laughs> it, it would just flip me out when he looked at me and said hey jim what do you think about this you know and i was like oh my god how does he know my name you know uh, but uh those are some of the things that kind of little things here and there that stick out, you know. Um, but there were so many things. Uh, like I said, I, I just got to. Uh, There's one person I didn't meet that I wanted to meet. Well, a couple, but I always wanted to meet. Excuse me, I wanted to meet Elvis Presley. Oh, yeah. I didn't never meet, get to meet him, but he passed away before I came with the Stout Brothers. But uh, I, I wanted to meet. Of all people, I mean, I did get to meet was uh, Billy Graham. And I always wanted to meet him, and I always thought, well, why in the world, uh, since I'm into the gospel industry so much, why haven't I gotten to meet him? But he got pretty sick before I uh, I had opportunity to meet him, and he was too sick to to be around him at the time. So I didn't get to to be there because he was my mother was such a big fan of of his, and and uh, just loved Billy. Everybody was, everybody loved him, but uh, but that was a regret that. Then I, you know, never got to, to meet him. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll wrap up. Um, my uh, last question I like to ask everybody on the podcast that it, uh, relates to: uh, Do you have a a venue or place or even a country that you've always wanted to perform at that you've never had a chance to yet? Ooh, Lord! You know. Um, yeah, I've always I've, I've always wanted to go to Ireland. I've never been to Ireland, and uh, I've always that's kind of Scotch Irish kind of background that I have anyway. Yeah. And um, had people talk to me about coming over there, but I and I was planning on actually maybe going this year. Uh, had had talked to some people about going, and of course the COVID thing happened, and we haven't been able to do it. But if it ever opens back up, I hope to get that opportunity. To go back to what I feel like may be my homeland a little bit, you know, because yeah. of some of the that I have in my family, in my life. Uh, I just have a, the beauty of that landscape and everything. It just pulls me whenever I see it. It just pulls me. Um, but uh, I, uh, as I said before, one of my favorite places is coming up there to y'all's uh, little barn and, and theater that you all have up there. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, your, your family was so kind to us and all the people. Um, that's one of my favorite places ever. I had another place in, uh, Arizona, the place called, uh, uh, right outside of, uh, it was in Apache Junction Oh yeah, I called, know. called the mining camp. And it, ah, uh, that was one of my favorite places on earth to play ever. And it burned down about three years ago, this July, three years ago, it burned down and they never got to build it back, oh. but it was a great restaurant. It was right there at the foot of the superstition mountains pretty much a different painting every day that God paints on up against that mountain every day. Um, there's a special, you know, you've had places like that. Just have special feelings yeah. about you feel like, man, that's where I want to be the rest of my life, you know, or, or whatever. Awesome. And so there, there, there's a lot of those places out there, but uh, the ones like your place that, you know, you can, you can count them on, on one hand, you know, that you really would love to go back and, and do it, do it all again. Well, we'd love to have you back for sure. So let's keep our fingers crossed. We're we're back to shows and and uh, 
But yeah. absolutely love to have you back. That'd be great. You haven't aged a bit. You still look the exact same. <laughs> same to you. <laughs> Gray and everything, but uh, that's because you can't see me from the waist. <laughs> the waist area has gotten a little bigger. <laughs> I just cropped this just right, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's been a tremendous pleasure. You've told some great stories, and I don't think I've belly laughed and had tears coming down my face listening to stories for a long, long time. And I really, really enjoyed it a lot. That fair story and the Jimmy Stewart story will last in my memory for a long, long time. <laughs> I loved it. Every minute of it. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, you know, this is what it's all about. We have to get out here and we have to talk to people. We have to talk to each other and keep each other going uh, through all this. And um, hopefully we can all get back and and uh, and be together again one day and shake hands and, and, and hug each other yeah. a little bit. Just so that. Wash our hands first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would you son? Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll never <laughs> so, if people want to follow what's uh, going on in your career, what's the best way to, for for people to do that? Uh, well, get on jimmyfortune.com. dot uh, com. Also, I have a new, really new album out with Ben Isaacs, Bradley Walker, and uh, Mike Rogers. It's called Brotherly Love, which is a kind of a quartet, but also has trios. It also has duets. It has. Lee, you know, uh, solo parts, uh, but it's called brotherly love. And if you can check that out, um, and then my album, um, God and country just won a dove, uh, GMA dove award for a uh, country bluegrass roots album of awesome. the year. So those are my two newest projects that are out there, um, right now. So, Excellent. Uh, yeah, some, some great things happening, but jimmyfortune.com and we're in all the major markets out there that sell hard copy, like, cds and dvds and things like that so yeah um and if you can't find it out there in cracker barrel or or you know we have you know uh cracker barrels everywhere down here i don't know how many y'all have up there y'all have cracker barrel up there no unfortunately <laughs> but we all we we go to them when we're in the states i got you i got you we need a uh, cracker barrel fix bad <laughs> well, it should be you know out there in christian bookstores and and some of the major markets that sell uh cds still sell cds you might say yeah it should be out there. So let me know if you can't get it. I'll, I'll see if I can get you one. <laughs> well, thanks again. And I really appreciate it. It was a wonderful conversation and uh, can't wait to see you again. And I uh, hope it's real soon. All right. God bless you guys, man. I appreciate it. Love you all. Thank you. you. Too.